Last week, we said goodbye to Dr. Michael DeBakey, the world's best known surgeon. His death, just two months short of his 100th birthday, has produced a flood of tributes. There was praise from world leaders, words of admiration from the famous. He's a guy who worked 20 hours a day and always felt like there was still not enough time. Uh, all of his colleagues always marveled at his energy, at his, at his intelligence. I mean, the guy literally really was brilliant in a way most of us can only imagine. And simple heartfelt thanks from thousands whose lives he touched. And without Dr. DeBakis, brilliant thinking, I would not be here. As we've mourned his loss, we've been reminded of his numerous medical milestones and his central role in transforming a fledgling medical school and small hospital into the hub of the world's greatest medical center. Most of us grew up with Michael DeBakey continually in the news. He added greatly to the image of Texans as brash and bold and resourceful. For much of the past century, his persistent flow of breakthroughs focused the international spotlight on Houston and made us all proud to call it our hometown. But this was just Michael DeBakey of the headlines. The whole story reveals a dedicated, gifted, and multifaceted man whose life and career are truly the stuff of legends. There's Michael DeBakey, the war hero, who along with Audie Murphy was awarded the Legion of Merit for the countless lives he's credited with saving during World War II. There's the compassionate physician who after the war was so moved by the lack of medical care for returning wounded veterans that he re-enlisted, remaining in the Army for three more years, setting up a system of medical facilities that evolved into a national system of VA hospitals. There's the selfless humanitarian who could have been the world's richest surgeon. Instead, he contributed his surgical fees to Baylor and lived on his professor's salary. And then, there's Michael DeBakey, the visionary, who used one of America's first satellites to launch the era of telemedicine a half century ago, foreseeing the day when high-tech communications would bring state-of-the-art medical information right into our homes, no matter how remote. Hello, I'm Greg Hurst, and welcome to a tribute to Dr. Michael DeBakey at the heart of Houston. Michael DeBakey at the Heart of Houston is brought to you by the Methodist Hospital System. Deep in the Atlantic, off the coast of Florida, a doctor performs an emergency surgery on a crew member of the submarine Nemo 7. Where would you like me to clip? Okay, go with one arm behind the, uh, the doctor now, The surgeon is more than a thousand miles away in Hamilton, Ontario. NEMO is short for NASA Extreme Environmental Mission Operation. It's the space agency's way of testing telemedicine procedures that will be critical as astronauts prepare for multi-year missions to Mars and beyond. Oh, I kind of got the abscess there. The simulated surgery took place under the watchful eye of Dr. Michael DeBakey in JSC's Experimental Planning and Operations Center. During the exercise, he was able to talk with the astronaut crew members. I need to get Trevor. What, uh, what are you guys seeing? For DeBakey, it was especially significant. In effect, those on the cutting edge of telemedicine today were paying tribute to the man who ushered in the whole concept of telemedicine. They began more than five years ago when America's first satellite, Explorer 1, rose from its launching pad. It was nearly 50 years ago when Dr. DeBakey watched the launch of Early Bird, the first intercontinental communications satellite. He immediately knew it had the potential to revolutionize the delivery of healthcare. It's just going to increase and improve the standards of medical practice tremendously, perhaps more than anything we have available today. Dr. DeBake had been promising doctors in Europe that he would come and lecture and demonstrate some of his recent surgical techniques. With the satellite, he could demonstrate to the whole world and not only demonstrate the surgery, but the potential of telemedicine. Within a year, he had actually taught Comcast, which owned the satellite, 
into broadcasting a live open heart surgery out of his operating room in Methodist all the way to Geneva. And he wanted it to be a two-way transmission. I could see them on the monitor in the operating room uh, sitting there in, the, in their amphitheater in Switzerland. And they could see me, and of course, they could watch me operate. And they were asking questions as I was operating, and I was demonstrating what I was doing. This was like doing the operation right in their amphitheater, which clearly demonstrated you know, the value of, of the, uh, this telemedicine linkage. An interesting footnote on the broadcast. It wasn't only a medical breakthrough. It gave Michael Dubakey another first in the record books. It was estimated that 200 million people worldwide watched the historic live event, the largest audience for any televised program to date. Just goes to show you that when Michael Dubakey wanted to make a point, he knew how to get people's attention. Dr. Dubakey firmly believed that telemedicine had the potential to raise the quality of medical care across the planet. It's going to offer the opportunity to extend the high quality and the high advances in medicine that exist in medical centers such as ours here in the Texas Medical Center to all parts of the country and all parts of the world. This is the pattern of blood as it's being ejected out of the left ventricle. Doctors at Methodist are today using Michael Dubakey's vision of telemedicine to spread state-of-the-art medical care around the world. We're very fortunate here at Methodist Hospital in that we've invested a lot in these new technologies. And up front, these things are very expensive. But as this becomes more and more popularized, so what happens is the cost ultimately comes down. DeBakey realized the impact it could have on healthcare to be able to instantly share vital medical knowledge. Within the last six months, we've had joint conferences with Mangalore in India, uh, with the Berlin Heart, which is one of the biggest cardiovascular institutions uh, uh, in the world. Doctors are now taking Michael DeBakey's vision to the next level and are now using robots to extend the surgeon's hands around the globe. What you're looking at here is really a robot that allows us to remotely control a catheter that can be introduced into a patient. Today, Army surgeons in Germany are examining patients still on the battlefield in Iraq. And NASA is planning for robotic surgery in outer space. And that's what's really exciting, is to be able to take 3D reconstructions somewhere in the world and navigate using a three-dimensional roadmap using robotics. And really, to the surgeons and interventionalists, that's the ultimate in telemedicine. Where others saw just a satellite, Michael DeBakey saw better health care for a whole planet. Wherever your imagination can lead you, that's, that's the potential. I can visualize uh, ultimately virtually every physician having a, a, a linkage uh, with telemedicine. Uh, in, in his office or in his home. And the time may come when this linkage may extend to uh, the general public. When you consider that today, the majority of Americans turn to the internet as their primary source of medical information, you realize what an extraordinary visionary DeBakey was. He had the ability, the uncanny ability, to look into the future and see what was going on. Richard Renardi is president and CEO of the Texas Medical Center. He's worked closely with Dr. DeBakey for nearly 50 years. He is a person with, a, or was a person with astonishing gifts, gifts of clarity, gifts of knowledge, gifts of kindness, but also gifts of great imagination. He had enormous ideas. The minute NASA came about, he immediately started to think, how can I use all of these things? Dr. DeBakey immediately enlisted the space agency in the effort to develop telemedicine. Over the following decades, it turned out to be one of the most productive relationships in the history of science. DeBakey got access to the world's most advanced technology and brain power, and in turn, he lent the fledgling agency every ounce of his expertise and considerable prestige and influence. When NASA needed six votes to get the space station, I went with him when he went to six congressmen whose votes he needed. He got six out of six. This is one result of that collaboration, the DeBakey Artificial Heart, based on the design of the fuel pumps 
used in the space shuttle. We'll get to this fascinating story as we continue to explore the legacy of Dr. Michael DeBakey. To date, more than 4,000 Americans have been killed in fighting in Iraq. More than 30,000 have been injured. One of those is Army Sergeant Sean Monroe, who was wounded in both legs when his patrol was ambushed. After a number of surgeries, doctors had to remove his left leg above the knee. Since the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom, the wounded have been flooding VA and military hospitals across the country. In one respect, this is something of a victory at least for American military medicine, because it means that more and more of our soldiers are surviving their injuries. Historically, war wounds were nearly always fatal. Even as late as the First World War, nearly half of those with battlefield injuries died. But in the Second World War, the U.S. had a secret weapon developed by then-Colonel Michael DeBakey. After more than a year of research and development, Dr. DeBakey convinced General Omar Bradley that it be used on D-Day. June 6th, D-Day. First American soldiers hit the beach. Thousands of soldiers died this day, but thousands of others lived thanks to a revolutionary system of caring for the wounded. Aid stations are established on the spot, and an astounding record starts piling up. 80 to 90 percent of the wounded received medical care within 10 minutes of being hit. Many of those who survived their wounds on D-Day and since owe their lives to the insight and dedication of Michael DeBakey. Well, in, in, in the military, surgery becomes of great importance from the standpoint of trauma. So we were trying to develop the logistics, so to speak, of care of the wounded. We had what we call general hospitals in place, and we had what we called field units, which were first aid sort of units. But the distance between the front lines and the general hospitals was quite a bit. It may be 100 miles. And it occurred to us that if we could put a surgical unit field surgical unit 
that could do uh, severe and acute trauma cases, like wounds of the chest and wounds of the abdomen. Uh, most of these individuals, you know, when injured in that fashion, would die before they could be brought to the general hospital. That bloody day changed the course of World War II. Dr. DeBakey's forward surgical units changed the course of battlefield medicine. And that gradually evolved into what we call the auxiliary surgical units. And we put them in a field hospital that was mobile, you see. Later on, of course, they became the mobile auxiliary surgical units, hospitals. And that's how it became MASH, Mobile Auxiliary Surgical Hospital. MASH is one of the most memorable series in the history of television. The characters, Hawkeye and Trapper John and company, have become part of American culture. Can we have some quiet in here? Don't bleed so loud. In many ways, the wisecracking surgeons of the 4077 epitomize the American hero. Cool, confident, and bold, using skills to fight for what's right. <laughs> that description also fits another battlefield surgeon, right. <laughs> Michael DeBakey, the real-life hero of MASH. Colonel DeBakey had proven himself to be a true war hero. In 1945, he and Audie Murphy were awarded one of the nation's highest honors, the Legion of Merit. Ironically, Dr. DeBakey's MASH units and other medical innovations were creating something of a crisis here at home. Soldiers who would have died of their injuries in past wars were now surviving. The Veterans Administration at the time was little more than a collection of old soldiers' homes. Once again, DeBakey went to General Bradley. He convinced the general that the Army had to step in and establish a system of hospitals to care for veterans. And he volunteered to remain in the Army until it was done. And in fact, I stayed in service an extra year for that reason, to organize it. DeBakey contacted 100 of his fellow Army surgeons and asked them if they'd stay on with him and start building hospitals. He described it as one of the most rewarding experiences of his life. I asked the surgeon general to let me call 100 surgeons whom I knew well. Every single one agreed to stay on, which really touched me. Today, there are 171 Veterans Administration medical centers across the country and more than 350 community and outreach clinics. It's fitting that the premier facility in the country is the Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center here in Houston. With the war behind him, DeBakey returned to his alma mater, Tulane University, and his mentor, Alton Oshner, considered to be one of the world's top surgeons. Oshner spotted DeBakey's unique gifts early on. He assigned the 23-year-old student to take histories of a group of patients scheduled for lung cancer surgery. Rather than turning in a routine report, DeBakey returned with a remarkable insight. All of the patients had been heavy smokers. A year later, Michael DeBakey, along with Oshner, published the first of his many scientific papers. The two began the crusade against tobacco 50 years before the U.S. Surgeon General announced a link between smoking and cancer. That same year, student DeBakey invented a new type of pump that eventually evolved into the heart-lung machine that made the era of open-heart surgery possible. Back in the 1930s, uh, Dr. DeBakey developed a pump for trans transfusing blood, where they would uh, have a roller pump and transfuse blood like from one patient to, to another. And this roller pump that he developed for blood transfusion was a, later on incorporated into the heart-lung machine. And so for many years, it was a, the main source of pumping uh, in the heart-lung machine. So he is, his pumping goes back into the 1930s where he developed this pump, which is initially or later on used as a uh, roller pump in the heart-lung machine. Before he had even become a doctor, Michael DeBakey had caught the attention of the international medical community. He never let it go. In the years after the war, Michael DeBakey was one of the best known and most respected doctors in the country. At the time, the Baylor Medical School was just starting up in Houston and wanted someone of DeBakey's stature to head it up. So in 1947, he agreed to come and meet with school and city officials. But at the end of the day, Dr. DeBakey said no and would return to New Orleans. 
Many here blame it on the curse of Jefferson Davis Hospital. We'll have more on that as we continue to look at the generous legacy of Michael DeBakey. This is the old Jefferson Davis Hospital on the edge of downtown, now resurrected as loft apartments. It has long been believed to be haunted, the curse of the hundreds of Confederate dead whose graves were violated in order to build the city's first charity hospital. The soldiers died in the yellow fever epidemic of 1867 and were buried here. When construction began on the site, it sparked a public outcry led by the Daughters of the Confederacy. Mayor Oscar Holcomb diffused the uproar by agreeing to name the facility after the president of the Confederacy. But apparently that wasn't enough to satisfy the rebel ghosts who residents say still haunt the place. In 1947, Michael DeBakey came to see Jefferson Davis. He had been asked to head the Department of Surgery at the infant Baylor College of Medicine. And Jeff Davis was supposed to be his teaching hospital. Well, as soon as he got a good look, he told Baylor, no thanks. A newspaper of the day suggested he'd been run off by the ghosts, and in a way, he had. You see, more than anything, Dr. DeBakey wanted to teach surgery, and this was not the teaching hospital he wanted. Houston was booming in the post-war years. Money was flowing, and the city simply bought whatever it wanted. When it wanted culture, it engaged Leopold Stokowski and then Andre Previn to lead the Houston Symphony. Ah, but Houston couldn't buy Michael DeBakey. So the city took a different approach. A group of civic leaders was sent to ask the surgeon what it would take for him to reconsider. One of those was businessman Ben Taub. Taub, who was on the board of Jefferson Davis, immediately took to DeBakey. The millionaire said DeBakey was the only man he'd ever met who didn't care about money. By the time the meeting was over, Taub had agreed to spend $2 million to just completely transform Jefferson Davis, and DeBakey had signed on with Baylor. His first priority was to turn Jeff Davis into a functioning hospital. It was the city's charity hospital, and by default handled most of the local trauma and emergency patients. In organizing the Army's mass units during the war, DeBakey had introduced the idea of a golden hour 
A patient had the best chance of survival if he could be stabilized within an hour of his injuries. He introduced this basic principle of battlefield medicine to America's urban centers and established the concept of trauma care as a new medical specialty. Two years after DeBakey's arrival, the once dysfunctional Jeff Davis became the first certified trauma center in the entire country. During his first year in Houston, Dr. DeBakey was admitting his private patients to the Methodist Hospital, an old building located on Main Street close to downtown. He developed a strong relationship with Methodist. They allowed him the freedom to put his innovative procedures into practice. One of those innovations was another variation of his golden hour. He created a new type of ward, staffed with a team of cardiologists and nurses he personally trained to care for his patients in that critical period following surgery. His patients who received this intensive care recovered quicker and with fewer complications. It wasn't long before other surgeons at Methodist were asking if their patients could be sent to Dr. DeBakey's unit. Methodist added more intensive care wards and the concept was soon adopted by leading hospitals around the world. In 1953, Methodist moved to a state-of-the-art facility in the rapidly growing Texas Medical Center. That year, Dr. DeBakey revolutionized cardiovascular surgery when he began repairing damaged blood vessels with synthetic arteries made out of Dacron. That seemed like a natural progression for DeBakey, who growing up as a child in Lake Charles, learned to sew from his mother. And I learned to sew as a, as a very young boy. I learned to, to do all of the fancy sewing, like tatting and crocheting and knitting and even using the sewing machine. Working on his wife's sewing machine, Dr. DeBakey created the prototypes for his Dacron vessels. Throughout the 50s, he racked up an incredible number of surgical breakthroughs. In 1953, the first successful repair of an aortic aneurysm. The first in darterectomy, which removed blockages in the carotid artery, demonstrating a major cause of stroke. By 1960, he had devised a method to treat coronary disease, which at the time was considered untreatable. He had done it successfully many times in animal experiments and had published his results. But the survival rate was only about 50%, and he wanted to perfect that procedure before he used it on a human patient. However, in 1965, circumstances forced his hand. And in 1964, we had a patient that we scheduled for, for what we call a coronary endorectomy. That's like the one we do in the carotid arteries. But this patient had an unusual form of the lesion making it difficult, in fact impossible, to separate it from the arterial wall. By the time we got to working on that, we had virtually destroyed the artery. And we knew that uh, unless we could get circulation into his left coronary system, he'd die. Dr. DeBakey's bypass surgery rocked the medical world. For the first time in history, doctors could offer hope to patients with coronary artery disease. It made the Methodist, the Texas Medical Center, and all of Houston the epicenter of cardiovascular medicine. A heart transplant was the next obvious breakthrough, and all eyes were on DeBakey. But the world was stunned when it was announced that a relatively unknown surgeon in South Africa had performed the world's first transplant of a human heart. DeBakey was uncharacteristically slow in jumping on the transplant bandwagon, although he did begin doing them once he had effective drugs to fight rejection. But because of the scarcity of suitable donor hearts, he wasn't satisfied that human heart transplants were the ultimate answer. So the focus of his research became development of an artificial heart. Ironically, it was one of his transplant patients, a NASA engineer, who helped Dr. DeBakey produce a radically new type of artificial heart based upon the fuel pumps in the space shuttle. We'll have the story of the LVAD, artificial heart, and one of the thousands of people who owes his life to the latest DeBakey breakthrough.
Michael DeBakey at the Heart of Houston is brought to you by the Methodist Hospital System. My name is Willie Thornton. Baker is six years old. And if it wasn't for Dr. DeBakey's brilliant effort at this battle called life, I would not be here. Life was going well for this father of four. Then, in 2000, the bottom fell out. They told me that I had congested heart failure, and right now, the only thing they was concerned about was getting the fluid off to try to, to relieve some of the pressure off of my heart. His only hope was a heart transplant, and that was a very slim hope. There was a long waiting list, and the number of donor hearts was extremely limited. Until we have complete answers to heart disease, there are going to be a substantial number of patients whose heart condition is such that you can do nothing but replace it. We know we can replace them by a heart transplant, but only about 2,000 a year, 2 to, 2 to 2,500 a year in this country. Yet the need for it in this country is probably in the neighborhood of maybe 50,000. Since most of the pumping power of the heart is in the left ventricle, the pump is intended to take over most of the heavy lifting, which gives the device its name, LVAD, for left ventricle assist device. An LVAD can buy time for a patient with heart failure, hopefully enough time to find a donor heart for transplant. The LVAD was the result of one of those serendipitous events that occasionally happens in medicine. A number of years earlier, another of Dr. DeBakey's heart failure patients, David Souchier, was in the same situation, waiting for a heart with only days left. It was a familiar dilemma for DeBakey and one that upset him every time. But Souchier was one of the lucky ones. He got a heart. You see, there's, there's the vein graph for you. Souchier was literally a rocket scientist, one of NASA's top engineers. After a successful procedure during his year-long recovery, he and Dr. Noon and Dr. DeBakey had a number of conversations about their hopes for an artificial heart. We first showed them the devices that we were working on and worked on in the past and told them why we wanted to make the changes and they said they'd be glad to, to work on it, which they did on their own time initially. And from that, we, over a period of years, were able to develop the pump, which we are now placing in patients. So almost a fortuitous relationship, mm -hmm. just by accident. Just by accident. Of course, he felt very uh, glad that he was able to help us and develop something that could have been a lifesaver for him or people just like him. The LVAC was implanted in my stomach with tubes running in my heart to help my blood flow. It didn't take the place of the heart. It helped the heart. Willie's strength and health improved. And then came another life-changing moment, a heart transplant. God spared my life, and Dr. DeBakey gave me life. You're looking good, man. It's Willie Thornton's way of repaying Dr. DeBakey. He's now a volunteer in Methodist Transplant Program. He knows what they're going through, and is there to offer them encouragement. Anybody who needs maybe some cheering up, I'm blessed. There's no luck in this. I was blessed. So he continues his rounds telling his story and spreading the legend of the world's greatest surgeon. You also, bless you. God bless you too. And everything will work Dr. out. Dr. DeBakey gave his time and his effort to, to help me to be here. So the least I can do is to uh, share his greatness with other patients.
Last year, when Dr. DeBakey was awarded the Congressional Medal, he used the moment in the spotlight, as he always did, to press the politicians to make health care their top priority. The opportunity to study this on a, on a longer term basis can only be done in microgravity over a period of time. You, you can't do it in, on, on Earth. Over his career, he seemed to become the nation's conscience for matters of medicine. Influencing public health policy, as practiced by DeBakey, is almost a new area of specialty, medical politics. I think it's very important to relate to the society you're in and to, in a sense, obtain their support for what you're doing. In a representative government such as ours, you, you deal with the, with the uh, legislature, with Congress, with the administration, with even the president and you try to convince them that what you're doing needs their support. Every president since FDR had lent their support to Dr. DeBakey. He had an unusually close relationship, though, with Lyndon Johnson. In fact, LBJ asked the surgeon to be his secretary of what was then health, education, and welfare. DeBakey told the president he could get a lot more accomplished if he didn't get tied down with the government. Johnson was also DeBakey's patient and was secretly traveling to Houston for consultations. LBJ was afraid his political career would be damaged if it was known that he had heart problems. The two Texans also shared deeply held beliefs about civil rights. Dr. DeBakey had a patient from Chicago sending him some x-rays and, and the patient had a large thoracic aortic aneurysm and asked Dr. DeBakey if Dr. DeBakey could treat it. Dr. DeBakey told him, yes, come down to Houston. He came down to Houston, it turned out he was an African-American gentleman. There were no African-American patients at that time at the Methodist Hospital or any of the Houston hospitals that were white hospitals at that time. Dr. DeBakey overrode the medical staff and insisted that they admit this patient and he be allowed to treat him because we should never turn down treating somebody based on the color of their skin. Intolerance was the one thing DeBakey just would not tolerate. Medical Center CEO and longtime DeBakey friend Richard Winardi once told the doctor that state agencies had been dragging their feet for two decades on accreditation for the predominantly black Prairie View School of Nursing. Dr. DeBakey went to the National League of Nursing and the other accrediting groups and said, you must tell me why you're not accrediting them. And if you can't satisfy me, I'm going to write an article to the New York Times and tell them that you don't want black nurses. Three weeks later, they were accredited. And then he spoke at their first graduation after accreditation and told them how proud he was of them. And on his surgical team, he had three graduates. Of all civil rights, though, Michael DeBakey considered health care the most fundamental. He insisted that medical care was a right, not a privilege. It was his guiding philosophy, and he wanted it to be the government's top priority. LBJ recognized DeBakey's efforts by awarding him the Medal of Freedom with distinction, the highest honor a civilian can receive. And the doctor also had support from both sides of the political aisle. Ronald Reagan honored his work in shaping public health policy with the National Medal of Science. A moment ago, I said that DeBakey had the support of all presidents. Well, actually, there was one exception, Richard Nixon. You see, when Michael DeBakey's name showed up in Nixon's infamous enemies list, the doctor said he was flattered. He considered Nixon a threat to American health care, and he didn't hesitate to say so. In fact, he had publicly and repeatedly denounced Nixon's budget allotments, which significantly cut federal funding for medical research. And, of course, there was the matter of Dr. DeBakey consorting with the communists. With the Russians in the 60s, when nobody would talk to the Russian surgeons, Dr. DeBakey befriended them and brought them to Houston. That's what began his long-standing friendship with some Russian heart surgeons. That doctor-to-doctor -doctor relationship and DeBakey's trips to the Soviet Union broke the ice in the long-standing Cold War. <laughs> his series of lectures and demonstrations of heart surgery became the basis of cardiovascular medicine in the Soviet Union. His lectures were transcribed and then printed, 
becoming the first textbook of Russian cardiovascular medicine. U.S.-Soviet relations really warmed when Russian President Boris Yeltsin asked Debeki to be in the operating room during his surgery and be ready to take over if anything went wrong. He served the, the kings and the queens and the presidents, but he also served the underserved, the, the individuals without resources, and they were, in his eyes, they were, they were the same, and they were treated with the same uh, commitments and whatever abilities he had, they received. And, and, and he expected the hospital to respond in that same way. Fame, like money, wasn't important to DeBakey. It was really just a tool. It gave him the access and the influence to promote his agenda. And Dr. DeBakey's agenda was to raise the standard of health care for an entire civilization. And he wanted the Texas Medical Center to set that standard. Are we ready? Yes, sir. See if it'll come by. Flush it again? What do you mean it's not flushing? Yeah, yeah. We cut it off. God damn it. I know, but you don't know what I want to do, you see. In the operating room with All a right, patient on the time. table, DeBakey was a stern taskmaster and would tolerate nothing short of perfection. See what I'm trying to do? No, 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 no. Put your finger over that. It doesn't take much effort to do that. He really did demand that you very quickly pick up on what you're supposed to do, and you always came in the operating room knowing what you're supposed to know, or you were just summarily dismissed. And one of the things it did teach you is that the patients are very important, and Dr. DeBakey didn't care how you felt. He didn't care how he felt. He cared about how the patient did. There is talk about that legendary temper that he had in the operating room. Was that more metaphoric or more reality? Uh, it, it was reality. In the operating room, again, uh, as he would say, uh, if you're a patient on the table, you want a perfectionist. You don't want a nice person. You want somebody who demands excellence and demands attention to detail. And there was nothing more important to Mike DeBakey than how his patients did. And if you stood in the way of his patient getting good care, if you made a mistake, you heard about it. Please concentrate on that. That's just what you got to do. Nothing else. Don't try to work on anything else, you see? But I, if I've got to keep on telling you that, it distracts me. It's really uh, some of the residents' lack of experience uh, the, and their stress. Hakeem Safi is now chief of vascular surgery at Memorial Hermann. 
30 years ago, he was one of those residents. DeBakey had met him while lecturing in Baghdad back in the 70s. When Saddam Hussein targeted the family of intellectuals and killed Safi's brother, DeBakey brought him to Houston and took him under his wing. Yeah, I lived in Baghdad with uh, thug Saddam and uh, his acrony put a gun to my head. And actually, when I first arrived in September of 77, they, my chief resident in surgery told me, Dr. DeBakey does this, Dr. this, does this. So I looked at him and I told him, does he kill? He said, no, I tell him it's great. <laughs> When a procedure was winding down and Dr. DeBakey knew that the patient was out of danger, the mood lightened, and he made sure he complimented the work of those who impressed him. Well, I want to tell you, you did perfect. Really, he wants you to learn. When I finish my rotations with him, he tapped me on the shoulder. I thought the nurse was tapping me on the shoulder. He told me, uh, uh, you did a good job. Of course, I was walking on cloud nine for three days. I didn't come down. You know, some people, they know how to reach to the, if there is a soul, and I'm a secular man, and, and raise your level of, to the challenge he wants you. One project that was especially close to his heart was the Michael DeBakey High School for Health Professions. And it wasn't just in name. He was actively involved with the school, bringing real world experiences to the students. Is he really gonna come over here? Does he really come to our school? And the fact that the Asher can see him, uh, I think that's surprising to them. I think they think he, isn't. some of our students, especially the young ones, think he's a name and that they would never see him. So they're just blown away when he comes by the campus. Dr. Charles Seta Deason of the DeBakey High School. He is forever reminding them the importance of maintaining high standards and set high goals for yourself. And he challenges students to, to be the best. And when he talked to them, he talked to them as if uh, he really has a personal interest in every single one of them and tell them always, he never ends a conversation without saying to them, I'm very proud of you. So the combination of education and a career that is satisfying provides an opportunity to be a good citizen and to contribute to the society in which that citizen lives. And in the final analysis, what nobler goal is there in life? He's always looking for a better way to do things and reminding us that what it is that we're doing is good, but let's continue to strive for excellence. The school mirrors his insistence on maintaining a standard of excellence. DeBakey's ability to inspire gets results. This year, every single graduating senior is going on to college. And among them, they've earned $10.5 million in academic scholarships.
Well, I think uh, those early years, uh, he and I were uh, working together uh, on some of the initial uh, uh, innovations in cardiovascular surgery, particularly uh, operating on uh, aneurysms of the aorta and so forth. And I learned a great deal uh, from Dr. DeBakey at the time and how to organize a program and, and how to uh, actually uh, attract attention to the program. I, I think if I had had only had the, the aneurysm uh, efforts uh, to myself, it would never have ex expanded into the, the level that Dr. DeBakey was able to make it. Did it give you some sense of relief that you were able to repair this relationship a few months ago? Well, I regret uh, I have long wanted to pay my respects to Dr. DeBakey because of the favors he extended me uh, by giving me my first faculty position. And I, I wanted to congratulate him on recovery from that serious uh, illness that he underwent and his miraculous recovery. Uh, from that. So it gave me a lot of comfort when the opportunity came uh, to restore our, our relationship and friendship. What did that mean to you just uh, several months ago when, when, you, when you got together and did that? Well, it meant a lot to me. It, it sort of eased my conscience about those uh, years where we had been uh, separate and never spoke to one another. Uh, it gave me a lot of comfort to restore our friendship shake hands and, and then to converse again. And uh, it was a very rewarding experience for me. Although Dr. Bakey and I seemed to accomplish similar things, actually our personalities were quite different. Our objectives in life and personal life and so forth were different. Uh, Dr. Bakey, almost his entire focus was on uh, his career and his professional life. And, and my interests have been broader than that, I think, uh, with a big family and uh, some hobbies which I have enjoyed and still enjoy. Uh, Dr. DeBakey denied himself a lot of those uh, recreational activities which I have enjoyed. The day that he actually unexpectedly died, I was visiting him at, at his home. And I spent over an hour with him uh, talking about uh, things that we were working on, things presently, things in the future, et cetera, and had a very good conversation with him. And during that period of time, I also was, ate with him. We, I, he had some gumbo at home, and uh, I went out to his garden, which he was a very good gardener, and he has lots of uh, peppers and tomatoes and things out there. Picked some peppers, and so I put the peppers to flavor the gumbo, and while I ate gumbo, he ate some some ice cream, and then when it came time to leave, I told him that I was going to my son's baseball game who was playing for in a tournament to go to state championship. And then the next week I was going to spend in Aspen with my, with my wife. And so as I started to walk out the door, he told me, he said, well, good luck to your son in his baseball game. He said, have a great week in Aspen, and I'll see you when you get back. As you talk about Dr. DeBakey, the danger is that you forget that he was human like you and me. But he was. And I'm certain that like all of us, he was not perfect. But I also believe he was very close. Very, very close. Beyond the breakthroughs, Dr. DeBakey established a unique culture that permeated every institution in the Texas Medical Center. A standard of excellence and integrity that emanated from the man himself. Over the past two weeks, talking with those who knew him best, it's rare that they talk about him in the past tense. It's as if for them, he isn't gone. In many ways, he'll never be gone. Michael DeBakey at the Heart of Houston has been brought to you by the Methodist Hospital System.